Unfortunately, um, Wi-Fi is not working for me here. Well, one of the, I call it a bug, in slides for, um, uh, in slides for Google, it, on the iPad, it requires you to have a uh, internet connection in order to present, which is probably one of the worst features I've ever heard of, uh, because it should just be able to download it and be fine. Um, okay, so I just got to put it into a lot of so maybe your password is wrong. Uh, your password have an evil guess in it? I'm getting a bit, I mean, if you want to tell it to my phone, I'm getting a bit of signal. It seems to be, seems to be all right. Your battery is on. Just sitting there spinning on it. So, <laughs> Is this a computer? Question. Uh, well, there is there is a PC somewhere, but I need to Yeah. All right. Well, how about this? Um, is this is this big enough for everybody, or is this going to be an issue here? Just don't just don't read ahead on me here. <laughs> Is that going to be okay? Yeah. For now? Okay. Well, if this pops on, um, we'll go ahead and, and uh, try to present if it, if it does connect to the internet. Um, so if you're here for CSS uh, Grids, I believe is what's published, I'm sorry. Um, you can take a nap. You can relax, watch some YouTube. You're not going to offend me. I'm I'm on five percent, but I am plugged in, so that's actually five percent increasing. So, <laughs> yes, um, the joys of having one US to UK adapter is that all of your devices are like 
barely powered at any time. Um, so yeah, I apologize if this isn't the talk you're here for. You're not gonna offend me if you wanna leave. Um, but we're gonna be talking about organizational security. Uh, a lot of people like to know um, who is this guy and why am I up here? Um, my name is uh, Chris Teitzel. You can find me on uh, Twitter, Techner Teitzel. Um, feel free to heckle me via Twitter. I'm totally fine with it. Um, I make mistakes. I'll say something wrong, and I'll definitely say something stupid. So um, go ahead and quote me on that. Um, on Drupal.org, uh, eight years, two months ish, um, on, under Seller Door. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of Seller Media. Uh, I also have a, a company called Locker, which does uh, encryption and, and key management. We'll kind of hop into that stuff later. Um, more and more now, I'm an information architect and kind of security specialist. Um, I like to call myself a reform themer. Um, I got into Drupal because I bought a theme off of uh, Monster Themes. It sucked. And so I just ended up rebuilding the entire theme layer myself. And then hopped on Omega and um, kind of rode the Omega wave in the Omega 3X days. And my claim to fame is that I am technically a third generation tech nerd. My grandpa started at IBM in the 50s. Uh, my dad said to hell with that when he grew up and said, I'm going to be a teacher. He started at IBM in the 80s. Um, I said to hell with that, I'm going to be a doctor. And then I started in tech about nine, 10 years ago. So I am proof that genetics are something you should never miss, mix with. Um, so let's just jump into it. The top five security myths are, there are only five. Um, that um, there is one single most important vector to secure in your site. Um, we hear this one so often, it's like, oh, I got a great firewall. Awesome, kudos. You've got one layer of many that you need to build. So a lot of folks like to, to focus on one layer, focus on one thing and say, if I do this really well, I'm gonna be protected. No, completely wrong. Um, we hear this one a lot. My website host will take care of this for me. Again, very wrong. Um, just because your host is compliant with regulation X, with um, requirement X, you still have to be using that host in a regulated fashion. So a, you know, coming up here, GDPR, a host can be GDPR compliant and your site could not be. So don't rely on your site and your host to actually be taking care of your site security for you. Likewise, don't just think that if I have a really secure CMS, I'm gonna to be totally fine no matter where it is. Again, wrong. Um, Drupal actually does a really good job, especially Drupal 8, now that we got rid of the um, PHP templating layer. Um, by getting rid of PHP in the templating layer, we are now you know, uh, preventing more and more mistakes from occurring. Um, but just because you're hardening your CMS, you can still put it on insecure software, you can still run it in insecure environments. And as we're going to talk about later, you will still run into places where um, you will be moving that data around and moving um, the site into insecure locations. Um, I can automate my approach to security. I apologize. We are all technologists. We, our end goal is to automate everything and basically just sit back and let the machines do the work for us. Security is not one of those things because at the end of the day, there is always a human at the end of the keyboard. There's always a human at the other side of what you're building. And if there's, always, if there's a human at the other side, um, there will be, um, oh, I just caught Wi-Fi. Yes. Awesome. Um, because there's a human at the other end, there's always going to be the necessity to um, plan for human interaction. So you, we, we won't be able to automate this whole thing. Um, and then last, but this is the one we hear the most, um, is I am too small to be a target. That's, you know, the BBC, Coke. These guys are the ones that they're going after. They're not going after my little site. Uh, and that's actually wrong. They're actually going after your site more than they're going after the larger ones because the larger ones are harder to get to. Um, one of the things you need to learn about hackers, if you don't already know, is that they're lazy. They're like us. They procrastinate and they're lazy. So what are they gonna do is they're gonna go around and they're gonna knock on every single door until one of them opens up accidentally. And then they'll put the foot in the door. And then they're gonna go around and knock on more doors until another one opens up and they'll put the foot in that door. So just because you're a small site doesn't mean you don't have something valuable. A, a lot of small sites don't realize, they will now because of GDPR and other regulations, 
that they do carry a lot of sensitive data in them. I've had war stories of just horrible, horrible um, data. I, I'll give you an example. Um, I'm trying to like protect my clients here, but we're in a safe spot. Um, I had a client come to me, I built them a Drupal 6 site, and I said, hey, my form is going wrong. Can you help me out? So well, what's the form for? Oh, it's to buy tickets. Oh, I didn't really give you an e-commerce solution. And I pull it up, and they had used a uh, web form to create a credit card checkout form that was saving the data to the database where they would then print it into an Excel spreadsheet to then hand to the office clerk who would then call in. I see a lot of groans and this and everything like, but this is what we deal with, right? So small sites, they don't know what they're doing wrong. And so they, they are actually targets because of that. The other thing is that um, a lot of small sites run up. I'm sorry, did I, did I like throw you into convulsions here with the, <laughs> sorry. Um, the other thing is that a lot of these small sites run on shared hosts. So these shared hosts have resources that are valuable, crypto mining, all the way to um, DDoS attacks. If they can take over even your little shred of, of processing power, that's worth something to them. So they're gonna continue to use that. And then as you can see here, um, there are myths that will go on for days, and we could write a whole book and just sit here and talk all day about myths that people come up with about security. So what do we do? What we do is we say, okay, we're gonna take a defense in depth approach to security. Again, we're not gonna do one layer, we're not gonna do one thing. We're gonna do a whole bunch of them. And the idea here is that rather than building a really, really tall wall, let's just build a lot of really hard hurdles to jump. And the more hurdles that you put in place, the more likely somebody is that they're gonna trip over one of them and fail, or you're gonna catch them after they hop over one or two of them. And so um, you can see here at the very external, it starts with policies, procedures, and awareness. We're gonna go into that. Today's talk is gonna be a bit more organizational and a little bit less tech heavy, but if you guys want to ask tech questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. Um, physical, network, computer, application, device, like there are multiple, multiple, multiple layers that we have to protect here. We can't just say, I got a firewall, I'm fine, or I'm encrypting all my traffic via SSL, I'm fine. Wrong. Like, we have to look at it in multiple ways. So what are we looking for? Um, OWASP is a really um, good bar to kind of set for yourself, and these are the, the top 10 from OWASP. Um, these are actually under revision right now. Uh, a couple of these will be changing due to um, kind of the, the, not the advent, but the more adoption of APIs and the microservice architecture creates some new um, interesting um, vulnerabilities that aren't represented necessarily here. There was some debate about and some um, obviously some con uh, conflict about what exactly to do those. As is always in the tech community, we like to argue amongst ourselves. Um, and so they're currently being revised and they're gonna be revised again. Um, there are some proposed ones, but these are what's there. So looking at it, injection. So SQL injection, Drupal Geddon. How many people remember and went through Drupal Geddon? Um, wow, not too many people. That is awesome. Um, this was kind of like the scariest thing that's ever happened is we all woke up one morning and realized that every single Drupal site in the entire world was vulnerable to a single attack. Um, and with a SQL injection attack like that, Somebody can get in, put an admin user on. Unfortunately, this was the time of PHP 7 where we had, or uh, Drupal 7 where we had the PHP filter. You can enable the PHP filter and take over God knows what on the entire um, website. So, um, so these are good, um, but these are baselines. So, um, so we had SQL injection, weak authentication and session management. Um, Drupal actually does a fairly good job of uh, authentication and session management. Um, but there are ways to uh, bolster that, which we'll talk about later. Uh, Cross-site scripting uh, is fairly um, obvious. Uh, insecure direct ob object references. Um, security misconfiguration. This is kind of the catch-all of like, hey, you're just not updating things. Over in the US, we ran into this with Equifax. They decided not to update Apache struts, and basically everybody's confidential information is now available on the web. Um, going on, we've got sensitive data exposure. Um, this is a big one, especially with GDPR coming up and how do you 
um, protect the, the customer's data? How do you um, make sure that the data that you have, um, so GDPR is more, and, and I hope you guys know about this, uh, but GDPR is more about kind of the right to know what's being collected on you, the right to being forgotten, um, but then it also, you know, what, what do you do with that information when you are collecting it? Um, so sensitive data exposure, in Drupal specifically, um, <coughs> there are um, convenient libraries for this, and I know because our team's built them, um, that with Encrypt now um, in Drupal 7 and Drupal 8, um, there really isn't a reason why you shouldn't be able to implement quick, easy encryption in Drupal um, for any field, form, whatever you want. It's there and it's available. Um, Cross-site re request forgery, um, using components with known vulnerabilities, again, keep things up to date, um, and unvalidated redirects and forwards. <laughs> so these are the top 10 that OWASP sets out and says, hey, these are the things that we're seeing most attacked. This doesn't account for you know, crypto mining in the JavaScript. This doesn't account for um, credit card payments and, and how we're, we're uh, processing credit card payments and using tokenization instead of um, passing the credentials to the server. So there, there are more of uh, these to be updated, but uh, these are good ones to look at. <clears throat> when looking at all of those, you can kind of boil it down to three, and it's the CIA triad. It has absolutely nothing to do with our US agency, the CIA, so don't be afraid. They're probably listening in on this, but that's completely different. Um, but when it boils down to it, security all comes down to confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Um, confidentiality, we all understand, right? Encrypt the data, keep it private. Um, the integrity of it, so um, the integrity of the systems, SQL injection, making sure that everything's up to date. But availability is the one that a lot of people um, don't pay as much attention to and are actually uh, more prone to now. And we're actually seeing more and more of the attacks coming through in this availability. Um, this is your DDoS attacks. These are your attacks that are just trying to take down the site in general. Now you may ask, like, why would a, uh, a DDoS attack or anything like that um, be, why is it that bad? I mean, if the site goes down, it's not like anything's lost, right? Correct, you didn't lose the, the specific data, but you're also losing um, function, you're losing commerce, you're losing um, your presence on the web. And so, though it may not be a data integrity issue, availability is a huge, huge business liability that, um, that we all need to look out for. So, um, with that, DDoS is the growing threat attack. It's, it is where, um, because of our environment of having connected devices, we saw this a um, couple years back with the IoT, um, that you're able to now take all these internet connected devices from thermostats to fridges to microwaves or whatever, and turn them into a giant botnet to take down sites. Um, this can be because you don't agree with what the site says, this can be because you want to um, expose other vulnerabilities within it, or you can just want to take them offline for, for the fun of it. Um, but we're seeing this as a growing trend. Um, so the question is, how do you protect yourself against a DDoS attack? Uh, and the idea with a, a specific DDoS attack is that um, they are trying to basically run an arms race against you and see how much do you have versus how much do they have. And can they over, overload all of your resources until your site just falls on its face? Now, the way that you can prevent that or, or try to stay ahead of it is to spread your attack surface as wide as possible. And so this is why having a CDN, we say, is really good for the marketing team because it makes all the images fast and the videos load and everyone's really happy about it. But from a security perspective, you're actually in a much better position because you're able to spread that attack surface out to the localized region. So if something's coming out of Russia, it's going to hit that Russian pop and take the Russian pop down. So maybe the, the Russian version of the site isn't going to be shown, but for the 90% of the world that is visiting it, it'll still be up and running and everything's um, valid in there. So it's a way to kind of spread that attack surface and again, think about it in layers and hurdles instead of big walls. If you all of a sudden see pops starting to go down, you have a chance to react to it before it ripples itself out to where your main customers are rather than oh crap, the whole thing's down, now what do we do? So um, the, the second stat here is actually pretty um, amazing. 579 gigabit per second traffic. Like that is massive. 
Um, and because of our connected world and because of our connected devices, this is now possible. Um, does anybody remember the, the Dyn attack a couple years back? Um, it was basically, um, thank you, US government. Uh, US government created um, weaponized um, piece of code <coughs> that somebody got a hold of and decided for shits and giggles that they would release it on the web and see what it does. And it ended up taking down the DNS backbone for like three quarters of the US internet. Um, that backbone is made to withstand this much traffic and it still goes down. So that's the type of, of attacks that we're going against. And by spreading ourselves out, by giving ourselves a wider footprint in the, in, with the CDN and just based on general cloud availability and being able to scale out, um, we're gonna be able to hopefully run that arms race faster than and shut it off before the attacker does. So um, what are some, we're gonna go through some like practical steps in just your website environment. Again, if you guys want to ask more technical questions, that's totally fine. Um, I'm aiming this more in kind of a, a general um, business sense of why we wanna um, protect our website environment. We actually see this a lot. Um, and we see it more often than we should. Luckily, because of the, um, the way that cloud services are running, we're seeing it less and less. But this is still an issue where your entire business, everything you don't want them to have access to, sits on the exact same environment that your marketing site does. Um, do you really want your ERP, all of your financial data, all of your HR data, um, trade secrets, whatever that is, be exposed via the, the weakest link, which is a marketing site, right? An insecure WordPress site or an insecure Drupal site can sit there and take down your entire infrastructure. Uh, again, what hackers do is they try to get their foot in an easy door, and once they do, they, they use that as a point to pivot throughout the entire organization. This is seen in, uh, uh, for instance, the Ashley Madison attack that occurred a few years back. <coughs> they didn't use any authentication past the firewall. So like basically once you got in, that same password was access to everything. And so yeah, they got in through a simple front end vector, and then they were able to ripple themselves through absolutely everything in the entire organization. And if you ask me, I'm kind of glad they did, um, but they were able to expose all the nastiness that was going on inside because they, they put everything into one giant bulk container. So um, this is the reason why I propose and, and push people to go towards managed hosts, get away from trying to host everything yourself, because when you do, you're going to try to make it as easy as you can on yourself, and you're gonna to try to put them all into the same environment. This should go without saying now, um, but HTTPS does matter, SSL does matter. Um, now Drupal or uh, Google is actually <coughs> warning, you know, the, the nasty like, hey, this security um, certificate is invalid. They're now extending that to if the page has a password entry on it and it's not using SSL, it will throw the same warning as a, <coughs> and it has a, as if it had a bad SSL certificate. So in other words, customers will start seeing really, really nasty, this is horrible, you shouldn't use this website, even if you're, um, even if you're, you're using a valid, um, or if you're using an invalid cert, or if you're using no cert at all. In addition to that, Google has now announced that they're gonna stop, um, uh, they're gonna be putting the insecure in the, in the browser bar for all domains that are not running SSL. Um, that's gonna start phasing into all of their products. So now, even if you may just have a simple marketing site, there's nothing fancy on there or whatever, you're gonna be branded as insecure. With Let's Encrypt and all the other options out there, there really is no reason that you should not be using SSL now. Um, it, um, it also unlocks a lot of potential and features. So if you wanna start using geolocation, notifications, um, anything with the smartphones and the device orientation, those are all requiring that you use SSL now. So you, you have to. Um, and again, a lot of the, um, a lot of the argument about SSL kind of in the past or in, still somewhat is that it's, it's performance heavy. It's gonna cause my site to slow down. From a server perspective, negligible now. That's not the issue. Um, it does cause a couple of extra round trips to occur. Um, and this is why having a CDN, again, not only does it make you secure from a DDoS attack and spreading everything out, um, if you can get that handshake to occur sooner um, in the chain, then you don't have to, um, 
you don't have to negotiate and do as many round trips, so you can actually speed up that, that SSL process by using a, a CDN. So once we've established that you have your marketing site and everything away from, um, from your main and your core resources, once we've established that you are using SSL, um, let's talk about the fact of why are we still using passwords. Um, I don't know how many of you um, have a multi-million dollar budget to, to protect your passwords. Um, I don't, and these guys do. So why are we trying to do their job better than they can? Um, they provide us simple integrations, so federated logins, um, social logins such as Twitter, and Facebook, and Google, 99% um, of your users will have those. Um, so if they, if they have that ability to use something that is more secure, let them. Um, a lot of those now have two-factor authentication, or hey, we noticed that somebody in North Korea is trying to log in to your Google account, probably isn't you, can we, can we make sure that it is? Um, I don't know if you guys have it, but we don't have the resources to run that type of validation on every single request that comes to our site. So, um, so using a, a social or, or enterprise login system, if you're in a larger enterprise or in your EDU, you already have that backbone available to all your other systems. Expose it to your Drupal site and allow Drupal to use that instead of trying to use your own passwords because amazingly enough, every year when they publish the top 10 passwords, ABC123, QWERTY, password, password123, you know, people try to get crazy and like password with a zero instead of an O. Um, all that type of crazy stuff, um, it doesn't really mean anything. Um, and the other thing is that the more like unique passwords that you put in place, and, and one of the things they surprisingly good in the US um, that they're starting to do is they're pulling back on the level of complexity that are required in passwords and saying entropy is now more required. So in other words, rather than saying, hey, you have to have three digits, two symbols, but the symbols can only be these three, and you have to use your first cats, you know, first initial, and all this weird stuff into your password, you say, create a password that's longer than 20 characters. Um, and if it's longer than 20 characters, it can be all lowercase, and you're still gonna have a higher entropy than trying to take a 10-digit um, password and, and mix it up with letters and symbols. Um, the other thing that you also run into is two-factor authentication fatigue, or password fatigue. And so, yes, you can have a really, really strong password, but your really, really strong password is in addition to every other really, 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 really strong password that they have to do, and your two-factor authentication is in addition to all the other two-factor authentications that somebody has to go through. And once you put that much burden on the, on the user, they're lazy. They're going to try to find a way to get around it. So what do they do? You can have two-factor authentication. They're going to write that on the post-it note and stick it on their monitor. They're still going to write the password on their monitor or on the sticky note and put it on their monitor. Or they're going to put it into an Excel spreadsheet because there's just too much for them to do. If you can make them only remind, remember one thing and one thing only, it gives you a better um, sense of, of knowing that they're going to be provably um, using secure passwords. And again, these guys' budget for passwords is much larger than all of ours, so let's let them do their thing. Um, when it comes to key management, this is kind of my big, big uh, pet project because this is all what my product uh, manages. How many people knew about uh, one login or the one login breach? A couple folks. Um, so one login is this enterprise identity management, single sign-on across all of your apps. We're just gonna hold all your passwords for you. Um, I'll read the quote here and then I'll explain. A review has shown that a threat actor obtained access to a set of AWS keys and used them to access the AWS API from an intermediate host with another smaller service provider in the US. Through the AWS API, the actor created several, several instances in our infrastructure to do reconnaissance. Um, one of the things that we're, we're finding and we're trying to squash as fast as we find it is over-provisioned AWS keys, and just in general, over-provisioned cloud keys. These cloud providers are giving you a lot of really cool capabilities and a lot of cool um, technologies to use. But if you use the one key to rule them all, the one key that accesses your entire cloud, and you go and put that into Drupal, where's Drupal gonna save it? One of two places, the database or your code. Both of those are bad. If I get your database, I now have an AWS key that has access to everything in your AWS environment. So that's exactly what happened here. There was a small marketing site that was on a, on a provider that they're like, 
they're trying to distance themselves from it, right? But they gave basically the master key to somebody, likely in this, and I've seen it happen before, hey, I want to use the S3 module to store images in S3 so that we can then um, you know, store them in, in S3 and use CloudFront and all that fun stuff. Great, well, here's a key, go use it. Well, that key's the master key. They got that. They're able to get into their cloud, into the VPC, actually spin up their own um, instances inside there, and because they had that API key, they were able to access all the encryption, they were able to access all the databases, they were able to have carte blanche to everything inside, and so basically one login came back out and said, oh, by the way, everything you gave us has been compromised, it doesn't matter, you're gonna have to re-roll all of your credentials. Um, which, at the core of the company, is what they do. So, not only is this just like bad practice, it creates a giant um, liability for your company in that your company and all of their infrastructure can be compromised from one single key that one person thought would be easier to, to you know, use for the S3 bucket. Um, so make sure you know what you're putting into your website. Make sure you know what tokens are being stored, what passwords are being stored, where they're being stored, and how. Um, in Drupal specifically, in Drupal 7 and Drupal 8, we created the key module. The key module is pluggable. You can use it to store your keys wherever you want. Um, but it kind of acts as a centralized spot where all of your credentials can be and you can monitor what keys are being used, where are they being used, by who, and then you have a place where you can easily roll them in the event that something like this occurs and you need to go back and, and redo everything. So now that we've kind of talked through kind of practical security in your website, um, one of the things that doesn't get discussed as much but des definitely needs to is just creating a security mindset. How do we how do we create our teams to be secure? Um, big, big, big caveat, I am not a lawyer. Um, feel free to sue me for as much as you paid to um, get this information, which is nothing. Um, and so, yeah, um, big disclaimer, everything I'm saying here, um, take it with a, a grain of salt when it comes legally, but professionally, um, I hope I have some credibility with you guys. Um, first off and for foremost, document absolutely everything. Um, most companies should and will have expected best practices. We expect you to have um, you know, encryption turned on, uh, file <coughs> encryption on your laptops. We, we expect employees to be able to, um, you know, in the event of losing a laptop, what happens. All of those procedures are there, right? Um, document um, project-specific security. Now, this is something that a lot of people don't do but thanks to GDPR, we'll start doing because part of the idea behind GDPR is security by design. The idea that you can provably show at the beginning of the project or somewhere throughout, we decided that we're gonna put security as a, as a forefront in what we're doing. So in order to do that, um, we need to look at what data is in the system inherently, what data is being collected by the system, and then show that we're doing this all by, by design, um, that we actually took security as a, um, as a concept at the beginning rather than bolting it on at the end, which always ends up occurring. Um, these data audits are really fun. Um, if you come into a new site, uh, we've done these with automated scans and stuff, and it's like, oh, look, you've got 20,000 credit cards in here. Awesome, now we're gonna go have to delete them, and, and why are we collecting them, where are we collecting them? Um, and then it's just really good to be able to show your client, like, here is all the data in your system. Did you know that this is here? Did you know you're collecting this? And do you really want to? Um, but this is one that I've, I've heard of recently that not a lot of people are documenting. And it's, when shit hits the fan, what do you do, right? Um, if you were to go to your CMO or whoever's in charge of, of uh, the brand of your company and say, Hey, BBC just called you, it's two o'clock in the morning, and they're asking about that hack that just got reported on Twitter. What are you gonna say? Chances are they don't know, and chances are if it's two o'clock in the morning, they're gonna say something really stupid that's gonna trip them up, and you're gonna be digging yourselves out of that hole in addition to the breach. So you need to look at every, uh, every layer here and start documenting. What's PR gonna say, okay? When the breach occurs, PR is gonna do this. Um, legally. Okay, we're gonna grab the lawyers. We're gonna get them in the room as fast as possible and figure out who's liable for what and how do we, how do we um, mitigate that. We're gonna get DevOps in. How did it occur? How do we get it to, um, how do we rectify it? How do we uh, prevent it from happening again? 
And then, if necessary, the criminal authorities. Who are we going to contact? How do we contact them? Um, who's going to be the one managing those contacts and those um, investigations that will have to occur afterwards? Um, if you have this binder just sitting there, waiting, hopefully never to be used, when it does happen, you can just pull it out and everyone has a sheet that they're running by and everyone is in lockstep. Um, it's gonna help your brand because in the event that you're actually having to pull this binder out, your brand is going through some damage. Um, it's gonna protect your customers because you're gonna have a, a quick response plan of here's what we're gonna do, here's what we're gonna shut off, here's what we're gonna turn on. Um, and, uh, and, it, and it just kind of creates a sense of, of calmness. So, um, in the event that you do have a breach, liability. Again, I'm not a lawyer, so don't take any of this as legal advice. Um, but uh, do you have liability insurance? Most companies do. Does that liability insurance cover cybersecurity? Most of them don't. So make sure that you actually ask your insurance broker, hey, am I covered in the event of a, a cybersecurity breach? Am I covered in the event of a data breach? And if not, get protection for that. Um, because, uh, one of the, the former CIA, or FBI directors is famously quoted as saying, uh, there's two types of businesses in the world, those that have been hacked and those that will be hacked. And they're pretty much turning into those that have been hacked and those that will be hacked again. Um, most people need to operate under the assumption that you will be hacked at some point. Um, so having this insurance and having this um, cover you in the event of that, uh, especially if you're an agency, like I, I run an agency, if one of our clients is breached, and they put that back and pin that back on us, then we have insurance to cover it because I don't know if, uh, if many agencies can do this, but um, if you're, if you're at, at risk of the, the liabilities for a data breach, um, hands up, how many small agencies are in the room or, or folks that run dev shops or are part of dev shops? How many of you guys can write a 100,000 pound check tomorrow and be in business? Right, so that's the thing is like, if you have a data breach, you have to realize that you're gonna potentially having to be writing a, a giant check, let your insurance company write it. Um, this is the big one we hear all the time. Well, my, my clients aren't requesting us to do this. No, they're not requesting it, but they're requiring it. They expect you to know what you're doing. So, so you need to be able to build that into, um, into your contracts, build that into your uh, practices so that you can show your clients, yes, this is something we are doing. Even though you haven't asked us to, Yes, it's going to add a little bit more to the budget, but you're going to be really happy when that day comes when all of your competitors are hacked and you're not. Um, and along those lines, make sure you have good contracts. Make sure you have it laid out with who is it liable for what. In the event of that customer who brought me their uh, website that I had built them that then collected all the credit card forms uh, or all the credit card information, I right away said, look, just for all clarity here, liability-wise, I did not create this, I'm not touching this, I'm not downloading, and I'm not accessing any of this credit card information because I don't ever want to see any of this information be liable for it. Um, make sure that you have in your contract who's liable for what and how and when um, because you may be really cheery-cheery with your, your clients and your customers now, some of you might not be, and that's normal. Um, but when a data breach occurs, nobody's gonna be friends, and everyone's gonna be pointing fingers, and you wanna be able to look at a contract and say, no, according to our contract that we both signed a year ago, you're the one liable for this, not me. Um, yeah, what's that? Oh, perfect. Um, backup, your backup of your backup. Um, I can't say enough, the, I have saved more sites by being like, oh, there's a backup that happened an hour ago, awesome, back we go. Um, and I've lost sites or had to recreate sites where it's like, oh, that didn't happen um, early on, and it bit me once or twice. I'll never do it again. Um, Git, this shouldn't have to be something I say in this room, but just use it, don't ask, just use it. Um, you'd be surprised at how many tech conferences I go to and I get like, should we use Git? Yes, don't FTP into your servers, it's bad, enough. Um, so the three Bs of a breach, um, breathe, uh, backup, and build, breathe. This is the first one that I don't think enough people take to heart. Like when you're hacked, it's stressful. How many people have gone through a hack? Oh, quite a bit of people. Um, was it a fun time? Do you have a you know pop yeah, beer we'll and hey? Tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, let's let's just do it again. Um, <coughs> stop. And I've, I've had to do this with our team. It's stop. Take a breath. Collect yourself because you're going to make 
knee-jerk reactions that are going to cause yourself more issues and more damage down the road if you're just trying to put out fires fast. So take a step back, breathe, control, can contain the situation, and then back it up. That way you can go have a post-mortem later and say, what the hell happened and why? Um, otherwise, if you're just in there fixing, like, oh, I fixed it, well, you don't know how it happens, so you don't know how to prevent it from happening again. Um, and then again, build, build fast, build whatever you need to do to, to get the site back up, to, to remediate the issue, um, or to, to fix the hole. Uh, but this all comes back to employee ed education. So how do you actually educate your employees or educate your team on having that security mindset? I like to partner up and have buddy programming, junior devs with, with senior devs, code reviews. It's very important that um, the best way us developers learn is from others um, and from Google and Stack Overflow. And so because of that, um, we're constantly seeking um, advice from, from others and seeking out how to, um, how to work with uh, the technology that we have. The best place to do that is those that have already been there. So partner up your junior devs with your senior devs. Um, take your post-mortem seriously. Don't just be like, well, that sucked, huh? Cool, done, now we're off to the next one. Um, actually look at it, look what went wrong, what procedures went wrong. Did I freak out and run around the room? Yeah, I probably shouldn't have done that. Okay, well, let's go, let's figure out what the procedure is next. Um, uh, give time for the developers to recap and review code before releasing. Again, don't just cowboy code, just be like, let's push it out and pray that nothing goes wrong. Um, review it, have other people review it. This goes back to the buddy system. Um, and then this is an interesting one, but reward failure. When, when, a, when a breach occurs, um, it sucks. But reward finding that breach, right? If you can find a bug in your own code or a breach in your own, or a, a hole in your own code before it actually gets exploited, that's not something that's like, oh, why did you code that wrong? You should have never done that. Um, my favorite example of this is, do, does everyone remember when S3, Amazon S3 went down in, in the US and like internet just started burning to the ground? Um, it was all because of one dev fat fingered um, a single command line that they were supposed to do some routine cleanup in S3 and it ended up just like deleting all of the buckets, right? Um, Amazon came out in their postmortem and said the failure was not the employees, it was ours in giving him the ability to make that mistake. And I thought that was really powerful to be able to say, yeah, they failed, but it's our, our failure in letting them fail. And kind of rewarding that uh, failure, rewarding that um, being open with that, that possibility. Um, principle of least privilege, don't let employees access things they shouldn't. Um, this, sh this shouldn't be um, something that I have to talk about, but again, it's something that I hear over and over again. I heard of a, a company recently that every employee on the first day got root access to the servers. Um, don't do that, that's bad. You trust your employees, awesome, I don't. Um, so, um, you know, people need to earn that. Um, and people will always make mistakes. So make sure that all of your permissions uh, or, all of your capabil or all of your actions are based on capabilities, not on permission. Because if it's based on just permission alone um, in saying like, I can delete that, then if somebody's impersonating me, then they can delete, you know, X. But if I should never even have the ability to delete that in the first place, if it's capability based, um, then it's like, I don't, I, I shouldn't be able to do that. So if you start moving towards capabilities and away from this like ambient authority of just, once you have the password, you can do everything, um, that, that starts to secure more and more pieces of your infrastructure. Um, oh, remote workers. This is, again, shouldn't have to be said, but GDPR follows you everywhere. So all of your remote workers are covered by GDPR. Um, protect your devs and you protect your clients and your business. So it starts with the devs. Um, encrypted data protects your employees. Um, so if you encrypt your data and then send it to your employees and they can't decrypt it, they're not able to be an attack vector for it. So that's why we promote encryption of, of data within Drupal is because you send it to a remote worker, their laptop gets stolen, great. Good luck decrypting it because they don't have the key to decrypt that production data. Um, secure team communications, keybase.io, if you haven't already used it, um, go grab it. It's like Slack, but encrypted, and it's awesome. Um, so you need to share that uh, password with somebody on your team, and you're not using a password manager, which is the next one down. You should be using a password manager, but if you're not, you can uh, send it over Keybase. It's encrypted between you two. Um, it also has like a really cool encrypted file share, so similar to Dropbox, but um, two-way encrypted. Uh, and it enforces that amongst your team that they use that. 
and then try to push it onto your clients. Yes, it's possible. Um, I have like a happy moment in my heart every time a client's like, hey, can I keep AC my password? It's like, yes, you're not emailing me your password anymore. This is good. Um, and then there's other customers who send me the root password via email, and then we have to go do everything all over again. Um, YubiKeys or other two-factor authentication devices are awesome. They're cheap, they're easy. Just plug them in, yep, right there. Um, you just plug them in, use them, and because two-factor is something you know and something you are, um, that YubiKey is a physical device that you have to have with you. Um, and then last but not least, uh, sales and marketing. I don't think we have many sales and marketing in the room here because this is more of a technical conference. Um, but use services and vendors that are, secure, are vetted uh, payment systems, it's really annoying and, and hard for developers to be like, oh, I built this really cool tool, and then you went and installed this like really weird widget in the sidebar, and then it just broke the whole site and caused a massive data breach. Like, sales and marketing need to kind of clear what they're putting into the site. Um, most of the website responsibilities now are coming underneath marketing. Um, as agencies, you're probably finding yourselves working more with the marketing departments than you are with the IT departments. These tend to be less technical people, so we need to talk to them about what the security requirements are and why it's important not to put credit cards in the database. Um, when in doubt, just don't post it. Um, this goes back to the, in general, just if you don't have the, if you don't need to collect the data or you don't need to post the data, don't. Um, and then the last thing is just like if you are around security or you're trying to market security to your customers, um, don't use FUD, uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Um, it's just kind of, it'll work, um, but is it really how you want to sell your service? Like, you're going to get hacked. You're, you know, you're going to be liable for all this damage. Ah, like, um, give them a sense of empowerment. Like, by using this or by us doing this extra service or by us using this extra product, you're going to be empowered to be safer. You're going to be empowered to do more. Um, and that I find and I've found through marketing our own product that the empowerment works just as well, and at the end of the day, you can sleep with your or sleep at night, knowing that you're not using you know fear to market all of your uh, all of your products. So, um, with that, I don't think we have much time, if any, for questions. Um, Let me very quick one. Yeah. The, 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 the most secure way of sending the username and password. Uh, again, I key base everything. Um, so, uh, if, if it is, um, it's like Signal or any of those others that are are two way encrypted. Um, it requires you to both have, um, it basically is um, uh, public-private key encryption between two people, but in a very easy to use chat-like form. So every time like you click on somebody's username, it like opens up a secure channel, negotiates that secure channel, and then you can start passing information. Huh? Key-based. Key-based. Key-based.io. Yep. Yep. Quickly tell us what locker is. Oh, sorry. Um, I don't like promoting myself too hard on these. Um, so Locker, we have a plugin that plugs into the key module, um, also into WordPress. Um, yes, I know. I do WordPress as well. Um, basically, the idea is that um, Drupal has two things available to it, the database and the file system, uh, both of which are passed around more than candy in the dev team, and uh, both of which are very insecure methods of storing your, your secrets. So we take those, encrypt them, and store them in our it has more acronyms and letters next to it, regulated vault, basically, of, of secrets. And it allows your, your website not to store any of the secrets on the site, but still have access to them as if they, um, as if they were right there. So um, if you are on Pantheon or using Pantheon, um, your site actually will already know who you are. And then the other fun thing about it is that we have dev and prod environments. And so by doing that, um, if you set a key in production, it'll never be pulled in dev, and likewise, dev to production. So when you migrate your, your uh, database back, you're not actually having to reset because, I don't know about you guys, but I've never toggled that mistakenly and charged credit cards and things that I shouldn't have. But if you were to do that, um, it, would, it would prevent you from doing that or sending the test email to every one of your production. Done that at least once. No, no, never. <laughs> so the tricky question is, that's us giving you our secrets. No, um, you are giving me an encrypted blob, which I am storing on your behalf and giving you back. Because what happens is, is before it even leaves Drupal, it's encrypted again um, and sent to me, um, <coughs> not me, but stored in the cloud. So what, I always joke that we could actually publish our database publicly and it wouldn't mean anything because you would have to have the, the alternate key to do it. So um, totally secure. 
um, actually helps meet regulation. And if you want to talk to me about its implications in GDPR and the right to be forgotten, we're actually coming up with some really cool stuff that will actually nuke customer data into the past in all of your database backups and all that too. So, how do you customers usually react to the uh, security topic in terms of you know topic and in terms of budget? Uh, in terms of budget, um, so it you have to kind of 